great delight to introduce uh, Ramdas to you. Um, he is one of the most uh, outstanding figures, one of a handful of people who is a, a ringleader and adventurer and sharer of consciousness in the movement of awakening in America and in the West uh, in a spiritual fashion for the last several decades. After his uh, a departure from the role of professor of psychology, either I would say an ascension from that role, even though he was uh, asked to leave. Um, he began uh, a, a journey um, as a leader of the movement of uh, re research into psychedelics and human consciousness, um, both at Harvard itself and at Haight-Ashbury, um, and then traveled on to India to meet a guru and do years since that time of very deep practice in Hindu and Buddhist traditions. And always in doing so, he has brought his humanness to these adventures and returned back with uh, stories for us uh, to know and to participate and to invite us into these adventures of consciousness. He reminds me of the uh, words of Mahatma Gandhi, who spoke, he said, Gandhi said, I have only three enemies. My favorite enemy, the one most easily influenced for the better, is the entire British Empire. My second enemy, the Indian people, is far more difficult. But my most formidable opponent is a man named Mohandas K. Gandhi. With him, I seem to have very little influence. Ramdas has gone on adventures inwardly and outwardly to Asia and uh, spiritual retreats and back again in every form of spiritual practice in the West, transformed himself, brought back the stories of his own difficulties and learnings and lessons in the most human way, um, and in that fashion become a gift every time he presents to those who listen. At the same time, he has also been deeply involved in the work of service, uh, working to found the Seva Foundation that uh, is, uh, whose work is to end blindness in Nepal. He works with the homeless in the streets of the cities of North America, works in a project with the Guatemalan Indian refugees, and in all of these, he plays with the great vision of how to bring spiritual practice alive in our own bodies and hearts and minds in this time. His most important gift, perhaps, is his heart and the ability to speak to people and embrace them and invite us all to inspire us to join him in this journey of consciousness in the heart. So I'm pleased to welcome Ramdas this evening. start slowly because, and remind me if I lose that. Thank you, Jack. I didn't know you thought all that about me. <laughs> Most of the time, he said. Most of the time, he said. <laughs> I, uh, I first want to express very deep appreciation to Stan and Christina Groff. I think that they're bringing us together in this lovely city for this sacred purpose. Is a, um, it's a great gift, it's grace. And uh, I feel like I'm part of Stan's integration of his past and his present, and I'm part, happy to be part of that. So thank you, Stan and Christina. Uh, 
I was in Prague last year and for the first time and I was so fed by the sense of um, expanding potential that I felt uh, standing on the bridge or being in the gardens or walking in the square and uh, I went home from that very fed very fed and when Stan called about this conference I uh, I said yes before I even knew what he wanted because if we could do it in Prague he had me I titled this lecture uh, Riding the Waves of Change because um, in the past year or so I've taken up surfing and um, uh, in surfing I actually use a boogie board which is a shorter board and everybody out there is 20 years old and then there's me and uh, but I've learned the relationship between uh, me and the wave and I've learned to have a healthy respect for it and I realize the bigger the waves the more you have to find just the right way to be in relation to the wave so that it doesn't do you in and that seemed an appropriate parallel to the world at this moment and our predicament we are enjoying the last decade of the millennium in a way none of us ever expected I use the word enjoying guardedly because actually it's scaring the hell out of most of us because the changes that are occurring are so vast and rapid and unpredictable and on the edge of chaos and there is a sense of inevitability about these changes it's interesting to talk to an audience that is so heterogeneous in the cultures from which you come because different cultures are riding different parts of the wave so that here in Czechoslovakia where there has been so much oppression the wave is the breaking out and the individual coming forth and the joy of individualism in my country in the United States individualism has been run right into the ground it's been run into total alienation and it's been run to the point where we are just at the turning point where we recognize that when we threw out our web our network our community in the zeal to be more individual we threw out something we really needed for the sustenance of our hearts and so now we turn towards community both of us here in Czechoslovakia and the United States are experiencing extraordinary change but they are at that level anyway going in very different directions but there are also and more profoundly I think than these pendulum swings there are big waves that embrace all of us in one of the um, waves I'm so aware of is the way in which my country and the other highly industrialized nations are exporting a whole philosophy and mythology into the world the um, free enterprise is obviously inspiring but along with it go a whole set of conditions and one of it is the need to create markets and I'm very aware for example 
I work with Guatemalan refugees in Mexico. We have three refugee camps. These are refugees who fled Guatemala after violence, incredible violence. And we were, these people are living very much like slaves in the sugarcane plantation. And one of the camps did not have electricity yet at the stage when I went to visit. One of them, we had already succeeded, there was electricity and water in it. And the third one had also electricity and water. When I went to the first camp where there was no electricity, the people were very quiet, very connected to the earth as sunset came, somewhat depressed, obviously away from their homeland, living with great hardship. I went to the second camp and there was light and there were children playing and there was a different spirit. I went to the third camp and when we drove in, nobody met us, surprised us. We found them all in a room looking at a television set. And they were looking at a television set that was showing an advertisement for a kind of fashion soap. Here are Mayan villagers who have fled the violence in their country, have barely enough to eat, and when we walked in, they couldn't even turn to acknowledge us. They were so transfixed in absorbing the desirability of that bathroom soap. And you knew that you were part of creating suffering right at that moment. Part of the creation of desire systems. And recently this year I was in the Marquesa Islands in the South Pacific. In an island in French Polynesia. Six miles by nine miles, 1,200 people who his diet is fruit and wild pig and fish. Most of them, over 80%, have never been off the island. And when I came into one of the buildings, there was the television on, which had just come in the past few years, and there was a Los Angeles police show. There was not a policeman on this island. And I realized the depth of what was happening through the information age in terms of homogenizing a culture, a world. Part of the dysfunctional mythology that is rampant in my country is one I've mentioned, this focus on individuality. Then there's the focus on the material. That is, more is better. Whatever you've got, if you have more, it'll be better. You'll be really happy when you have more. And then there's competition. The idea that survival of the fittest is really the only law that's worth attending to. Then we have the profit motive. That the prime criterion of happiness is an increase in the gross national product. And finally, we have anthropocentrism. That humans are where it's at and they control all of it. Animals, the earth, all of it. To, I can't quite express to you how far I feel the whole process has gone. I have one little story. Um, I had a friend in Washington. His name was Milton Friedman. Now, there is another Milton Friedman who is an economist. And my friend Milton Friedman was a speechwriter at one point in the White House. 
And one day he received a telephone call. Caller said, is this Milton Friedman? And he said, yes. And the caller said, I represent a church in California and we have a large surplus in our accounts of money and we wonder if you could suggest how we should invest it. <laughs> to which my friend replied, have you considered giving it to the poor? <laughs> to which the man on the phone replied, is this the real Milton Friedman? <laughs> to which, to which my friend replied, is this the real church? Of, um, of things that are changing so fast. Um, we've been talking about them even for the past day already. But, and let me just run through the list. So you just let me punctuate each one by silence and not talk about it since you probably know about it as well as I do. Let me just mention it and just stay open to each one. Shrinking rainforests. Global warming. Thinning of the ozone layer. Contamination of the groundwaters of the land masses. Contamination of the oceans and the fish in the ocean. Increased air pollution and the resultant uh, respiratory illnesses. The inability to find a safe way to dispose of nuclear waste. An extraordinary population explosion. An increasing polarization between the poor and the rich, with a smaller and smaller percentage being the haves and a larger and larger percentage being the have-nots. Increased hunger and famine in the world. Increased number of refugees in the world who are fleeing economic, political, or ecological conditions. Increased inner city violence. Deepening racism and ethnic tension. Dramatically increased use of drugs such as cocaine, crack, and heroin. An AIDS epidemic that is still being denied by most of the world and at which at this moment in many countries in Africa, one third of the pregnant women are HIV positive. A 
multinational businesses that are now the most powerful social institutions that have no moral and ethical responsibility to anybody but to their shareholders. Those are the negative ones that I could think of. I'm sure you could add. President Havel, in a, um, a letter that appeared in the op-ed section of the New York Times in May, said the first global technical civilization has reached the limits of its potential. The point beyond which the abyss begins. He talks about the history of all of this rooted in reverence for the rational mind from the Renaissance to socialism from positivism to scientism, from the industrial revolution to the information revolution, a dawning recognition that this world of depersonalized objectivity is not our salvation. Just to balance these dark lists, just let me add the positive ones, the end of the Cold War, the breakdown of the wall, the end of the communist dominion, the lessening of nuclear tensions, dramatically changed the growing environmental awareness despite the United States position in Rio. The changing role of women. Technological leaps in life expectancy, in ability to extend life expectancy, ease of living, Unfortunately, it's still for the few. I've just had a dramatic example of the way technology is improving life. I work with um, the Seva Foundation, which works with the blind in Nepal and India. And we are involved in perhaps in helping the Nepalese become self-sufficient in eye care and the Indians to do the same and to deal with incredible backlogs. In Nepal, when we started working, there were 200,000 people who were blind because of cataract, which required an operation that took four minutes and at that time cost five U.S. dollars in which the lens is cut, the opaque lens is taken out, the cornea is stitched up, and then the person is given these thick glasses. And when they were blind in a very poor country, they suddenly can see. We started that in 1980. We built eyeglass factories, we had eye camps, we built hospitals, we trained, helped the Nepalese become ophthalmologists, with a whole system, beautiful, beautiful, 12 years we've been at it. Similarly in India, in southern India. Now, in the United States, on the other hand, when you get a cataract operation, they cut cornea, take out the lens, and they put in a little plastic lens, and they sew it up, and you have 20-20 vision, perfect vision. 
No glasses to break, no thick glasses that you can hardly see through that keep getting dirty in the fields, none of that. But only the rich people get those. Poor people get the thick glasses. They go to work in the fields, the glasses break, the glasses get covered with the flax and the seed from the wheat. The intraocular lens, as it's called, costs in the United States about $250 for an ophthalmologist to get it. The operation costs about $1,500. This past year, we along with Aravind Eye Hospital in India built an intraocular lens factory in South India that produces those same lenses to the same quality as the United States for five dollars a lens. Right? That means because it offended our sense of decency that the rich people should get the lenses and the poor people shouldn't. And we will work that so that just as we work the hospitals in India and Nepal so that 70 percent of the patients are given everything free and it's covered by the ability to pay of the other 30 percent and they get better cabins. In changing conditions as dramatic as these are, how are you and I to respond? I think most of us are appreciative that something's called for in us, but we aren't quite able to figure out how to do it, or what to do, or how much to do. Many of us save our cans and bottles for recycling, but is that really going to be enough? Many of us want to want to change, but we don't yet want to change. Like I have a car, it's an 18-year-old car, and it was given to me by my stepmother before she died. I love the car. It's a nice car. It also contaminates the universe. Now, I'm a conscious fellow. I speak about pollution. What should I do? I still have the car. I don't want to have the car, but I don't want to not have it either. You may not be in those predicaments. I find myself in those. Certain changes we can make easily because we see that we don't really give up anything and we get something in return. But there are deeper changes, the kind that David Stendelrass was talking about this morning. We talked about crises where you come to you come to something that doesn't work anymore. Those are the ones that are interesting about how we deal with those changes. Most people in response to intense changing conditions get frightened. And when they get frightened, they do a lot of interesting things. First of all, they hold on tighter to what they have. They start to resist change. They go into denial to make believe nothing's happening. I do all these things too. They try tokenism, like bottles and cans. As things get worse, they go into depression, despair, anger. These are the sequences that people go through as they start to 
deal with ch conditions that are changing when they get frightened. And what happens to a large number of us is we get more conservative. There is an increase in fundamentalism, in ultranationalism, in ethnic prejudice, in vi ultimately in violence in order to hold on to what you have. And if you look at the have and the have-nots of the world, you see an incredibly destabilizing condition in which at some point the have-nots no longer say, it's wonderful that you have it, we'll wait for the trickle. They say, enough already, and then something changes. We can feel the breath on our necks. We can feel the imminence of profound changes in all of our lives. We can't even begin to imagine them. The question I ask you is, where can you and I stand in relation to those changes in such a way that we can not be instruments of exacerbating the problem, but rather could be instruments for transforming a transformative process that is gentle, that is loving, that is compassionate. Some changes, it's just simply enough to give people information. And to the extent that there's no much pressure on them, they will change. For example, in New Mexico, in the United States, the government has built a huge $800 million hole in the ground to put nuclear waste. But the problem is it hasn't successfully met environmental safety standards. But there is tremendous pressure to get rid of the waste. It's like you being constipated. And there's only a certain amount you can take. So the government was trying to make believe everything was all right and they were overriding the environmental safety concerns. So my colleague, Jai, and they were going to transport the nuclear waste through all the main highways, through from all the different places in Washington State and Savannah and so on. So he stood on a corner in Santa Fe with a sign. And it just said, during rush hour, just one person. And he said, imagine a nuclear accident here. Just one person stood there. Photographer from the paper took a picture, it went on the front page, people started to gather. Pretty soon hundreds of people were involved. Pretty soon every business had a sign saying, stop, whip the waste experimental project until environmental standards are met. And the government and Congress was stopped cold. Everybody said, aren't we wonderful? Might and good and right one. Then the government said, look, if we stop WIP, you're going to lose 2,000 jobs in a depressed economy. Now, it's a whole different ballgame. Now, it's a battle of goods against goods. So you see that information was sufficient until people's economics were on the line, then it was a whole different ballgame. Now, um, for the kinds of changes that are required of us, not only do we have to change our behaviors, but we have to go deeper than that. David Bohm said, a change of meaning is required to change the world's politics, economics, and society. This change of meaning must begin with the individual. It was the same topic to which David Stendelrass spoke this morning. I would like to propose 
that whether or not you are part of the problem or part of the solution depends upon who you think you are. Let me spell it out. When I, when I say the question, who do I think I am, I'm reminded of uh, the story of Nasruddin, the Sufi um, crazy man, mystic. I got this story from uh, Jack Hornfield. And the Sufi uh, Nasruddin goes into a bank and he's very disreputable he to cash a check. And the teller says, studies the check, he says, the check looks fine. And then he looks at Nasruddin, who looks terribly disreputable. And he said, uh, but uh, do you have identification? So Nasruddin reaches into his pocket and he pulls out a mirror and he says, yup, that's me. <laughs> Who you and I think we are is that sort of, yup, that's me. But it bears a little more interesting examination. Until 1961, I was quite certain that who I was was who my parents had told me I was. I was somebody. I was Richard. I was good. I was an achiever. I had another of other characteristics. In other words, I was identified with my personality. I was also a professor, I was a cellist, I was a pilot, and I enjoyed all those identities as well. In 1961, I took psilocybin, the psilocybin mushroom. And to put it very simply, I found out I wasn't who I thought I was. That who I was was much more interesting than who I thought I was. And I would say that for the past 30 years, I have been growing into what I learned that first experience. What I learned I could convey to you through uh, an image that I've used often, which is that of television channels, since most of you are familiar with television. Television receiver dial selector right here next to your eyes. Set it on channel one and you look at me and what do you see? You see an attractive elderly gentleman. You see a physical entity. When that was my primary identification, when that's who I thought I was, was my body, as I grew bald, I grew a long piece of hair that I wound over here because the image of me bald was unacceptable because my identification with having hair was so powerful that I had to be aware of the where the wind was all the time. And so, and so, uh, Now let's switch to channel two. Now you look up here and what do you see? You see a warm, vibrant, uh, intelligent, sensitive um, lecturer, um, mild manic depressive, um, <laughs> and so on. In other words, you see my psychosocial identity. Right? That's my Ram Dass-ness. And you and I have many roles within those particular theater pieces. Um, you don't keep one role. If you're a truck driver and you're in bed, you don't say, I'm a truck driver. <laughs> you are called upon to fulfill other roles. Most of us have a lot of horizontal costume changes we go through every day. Now let's switch the dial, the next one. This is now, right now, starts where the psilocybin kicks in. Okay. The first two, everybody's got 
that's what you would train to, and that's all real. And the, you would train so well into those first two that you would train to ignore all the information from everything else. In other words, all the rest of the channels were treated as static, and you had a receiver which received two channels. That's what you got in this karmic deal. Now let's shift to channel three. You look up here, and you see an Aries. <laughs> you see an archetypal figure. You see a mythic identity. You see uh, a seeker after truth. Whatever those are, you see the bigger than life scenarios, which are all the part of our uniqueness as individuals. It's called the astral plan in one system. Now, I have a, just a lovely story to share with you about the astral plan. After I had been in India for some time, I came back to the United States and I was practicing because once you understand what you're trying to do, you're trying to live, to learn, to open to these different channels and integrate them. So I was spending a lot of time in those days on the astral planes. And at one point I had an old, old car that I was driving across the United States and I was sitting in the front seat, it was a very heavy old limousine, and I was driving on the New York Thruway and I was doing um, a mantra with my beads and I was saying the names of God, different names of God, and I'd spend a day on each name, you know, each name. They're all the same name, it's just different strokes for different folks. And so one day I was working with Krishna this particular day, and Krishna is blue. He's always characterized as a blue being playing a flute. So I was doing Krishna, 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 Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna. I was going along about 40 miles an hour, one leg tucked under me, and I was, it was going to be a two-week trip across the United States. And I suddenly was aware in my rearview mirror of a blue flashing light. So I, I knew, I mean, I hadn't lost the other two channels. <laughs> so I knew it was a state trooper, a policeman, and I pulled over, and he came up to me, and I rolled down my window, and he said, may I see your license and registration, please? Now, if you've been singing to Krishna for about 10 hours, and he's blue, and a blue light flashes and then this being comes to your window. I mean, he not only could have had my license and registration, he could have my life. I mean, this is like, I mean, you know, Christ came as a carpenter. How would they come now as a state trooper? Why not, you know? So, he took my license and he checked the car and he called home and he did whatever policemen do. And then he came up and he said, you're going too slowly and uh, you'll have to drive on an ancillary road, another road. Now, at this point, I'm just looking at him with so much love because I'm having darshan of God. I mean, who he thinks he is is his problem. Well, it turns out that state police very rarely are loved that way. <laughs> At least when they're in their uniforms. <laughs> so now he's got the problem that he's finished our business, but he doesn't want to go away. <laughs> so he says, nice car you have here. which allows us to talk some more, and finally he says, after we've, he's run out of topics, he now either has to admit that he's Krishna, okay. but if he wants to carry the charade all the way, that's up to him, and he says, be gone with you, which is not really state trooper talk. 
and he walks back to his car and as I drive away I look in my mirror and he's waving at me now you tell me who was that alright let's turn the dial one more now we tune into what the Christians call the soul. You look into somebody's eyes and you see another being looking out at you. Are you in there? I'm in here. How did you get into that one? And you see this soul that has been incarnated into a body, a personality, a whole psychosocial trip an astral identity, but it's another soul just like you. Here we are, you here, I'm here. It's far out, great trip, isn't it? Wow, you come to Earth often? <laughs> now, that's an interesting one because that one ceases to be quite as solid. It gets more because they're, you're used to focusing on people in terms of their individual differences. And now you're seeing that it's another being just like you. It has a different karmic DNA code, but it's basically just like you. And the, the communication between souls is not really at the level of conceptual intellect so much. I'd like to share a, one of my favorite all-time stories just to convey the feeling of that plane. I was invited by John and Tony Lilly to swim with their dolphins, Joe and Rosie, who were at a um, tank in Redwood City, California. And a friend of mine and I <clears throat> came on a very cold gray day to these huge tanks in which these dolphins were swimming. My friend got into the water. I had my bathing suit on. I was shaking with cold. And in my mind was going through thoughts like, what am I doing here? Why am I supposed to want to be swimming with dolphins? Right. This is absurd. I'm too old for this. However, everybody is standing around, so I go. I get into the holding tank and start to tread water. Now, uh, everybody is watching around the tank to see how Ramdas is with the dolphins. <laughs> so, whatever I might be feeling inside, I'm smiling. The first thing that happens is the dolphins go by me very fast and very close. And they're considerably bigger than I expected they'd be. <laughs> After some time, one of the dolphins, Rosie, hovered, I guess you'd call it, right here. And I thought, what am I supposed to do now? and a desire arose in me to touch the dolphin. So I reached out and I touched the dolphin. Now, I, I know it's a mammal, but in my, because it's got a tail and all, it's a fish. And when you touch fish, they swim away. So I touched the dolphin and she didn't move. And my mind said, what, I want to touch it again. So I touched it again, I ran my hand down, and it was this silky, silky skin. It was almost all water. It's just absolutely delicious. And she didn't move. And at that moment, I became aware that she knew I was touching her, and she was right there, and that she and I were in this relationship. And I knew that she wasn't thinking, I'm a dolphin, I'll let him touch me. <laughs> and at the moment of this awareness of her presence, where I was running my hand gently down her back, 
I let go of the analytic processes for a moment, and I went into a, just a kind of an open ecstasy. The minute I experienced the first moment of ecstasy, Rosie flipped her body till she was upright in front of me and came towards me, and I found myself holding her, kissing her on the mouth, and saying, oh, Rosie, oh, Rosie. At this point, Rosie started to insinuate herself into my body. And I began to become aroused. Now, everybody is watching what's going to happen with Ramda, so I am smiling. <laughs> but I am thinking, is this legal? After that, she came around and came in under my arm, and I held her fin, and she went down, and I let go quickly so I wouldn't hurt her, and then she came back in under my arm, and I did that again, and it's, my hand slipped off, and once again, she came under my arm, and what I wanted to do was put my hand around her belly and hold on, but I didn't want to hurt her. Finally, I did that, and she started to swim wildly, and I thought, oh, I'm disturbing her. I'll let go and I floated to the surface and she immediately came in under my arm. So I felt I was being trained. <laughs> so I just grabbed her around and we started to swim wildly through the tank. After about 40 seconds, the thought occurred to me, Rosie, you're a dolphin. I am a human. I need air. that thought occurred, Rosie brought me to the surface immediately, and I took a breath of air, and then we continued our swim, and for the next 30 minutes, she brought me to the surface every time I needed air. At one point, when she came to the surface, usually we'd come up and I'd take in a big breath of air, and then we'd go down again. But people were taking pictures of Ramdas with a dolphin, and I began to ham it up a bit. Um, you know. <laughs> and at this point, Rosie went down, and I had no breath. <laughs> and I said, well, Rosie, this is it between us. At which point, she came right back up again just maybe three seconds. At the end of 35 minutes or so, I was so cold, I was shaking, but I couldn't stop. The ecstasy was so great. And she shook me off, and she went and got Joe, and they both nosed me over the holding platform and forced me out of the tank. Now, to me, that's a story in which Rosie and I met at a place of intuitive heart connection that had in it a great deal of wisdom. And it was when I let go of my analytic process for a moment that the connection was made. Um, I just came across this article. It said, out of the tragedy and misery of the devastating cyclone in Bangladesh, came this story. State Minister for the Environment, Abdul Lal Al Naman, told reporters that a dolphin took hold of a baby who had been swept out to sea at the village of Yukia by a tidal wave during the height of the April 29 cyclone. The baby was delivered back to shore 18 miles from Yukia, 
where people took the child from the dolphin's mouth and took it to a district hospital where the infant was said to be recuperating. Isn't it fun? Now those are just, I mean, extreme examples of meeting another soul. Let's shift the channel just once more. And now what you're looking at is yourself looking at yourself looking at yourself. There's only one of it. That if you extricate your awareness from your identification with channels one through four, all that's left of you is, is. And is and is is just is. You don't have more is than I have. You don't even have a different is than I have. Call it awareness, call it God, call it presence, call it whatever you want. One of the things you could call it is love. Zen master Yasutani said, our true nature is beyond all categories. Whatever you can conceive or imagine is but a fragment of yourself. Hence the real you cannot be found through logical analysis, deduction, or intellectual analysis, or even endless imagining. of that plane of reality, if you would call it that, and this is just a metaphorical system, is that it has no time and no space in it. It has no form in it. And yet it is as much who you are as every other channel. As you pull your awareness back from time so that you see time as a river moving and yet you rest in that which is timeless. T.S. Eliot says, we cannot stick to the moving finger of time on the surface of the sphere, but must descend into the still point of the turning world. All of those planes, and many more, but those are the crudest description, all became apparent to me in that moment in 1961, although I didn't even know I knew them. And since that, all of my spiritual practices have been an attempt to open back up to the fullness of my being. It's not like these higher planes of consciousness weren't there all along. I had just been trained to not know them. Those of you that have raised babies often see in the baby a spaciousness of awareness that then starts to get lost as the child gets socialized into somebody-ness because we go into somebody training. In my work with the dying, which is something that I do a great deal of, is sitting with dying people as they're dying. What I find is that my work on myself in that process, to constantly keep the spaces open of all these channels simultaneously, allows me to see before me a person who has AIDS and is dying, that's channel one and two usually. But it also allows me to see another soul 
who is going through a journey different than my own. And when we can meet in that place, the person's fear that came from identifying with their bodies is alleviated in some degree because they recognize another part of themselves that has nothing to do with birth and death. To me, that is a treasure that one shares through one's being. When Mahatma Gandhi was asked for a message to take back to a village, he scribbled, the train was moving out of the station, and he scribbled on a paper bag, my life is my message. What you and I offer to the world and to each other is what we are. And as human beings, what we are is so much more vast than what we allow ourselves to be. When I was a psychologist, I had major neuroses. Major. My analysts thought I was too sick to function. These neuroses were the kind that would appear as dark beings and they would possess me. They would take me over against my will because I was good. For example, one of these was lust. And I could be this beautiful spiritual being and through a concatenation of conditions something would come along that would call that neurotic characteristic of lust forth and it would slowly possess me and I would find myself saying wouldn't you like to come up and see my holy pictures <laughs> and I was appalled Somebody recognized it. As a result of the spiritual work of 30 years, more and more I find that my what were once these monstrous neuroses have turned into these small little shmoo-like animals. That when they come along, I say, Oh, I haven't seen you in ever so long. Come in and have tea. And I now see my neurotic personality characteristics as my style. <laughs> I had another interesting um, moment about this business of holding tightly to any definition of a person. My father was a very successful and um, strong man. I have 14 minutes. And uh, he um, got very old. And I uh, spent many years taking care of my father until he died. And as he got near 90, he started to get very quiet inside. And since I was working on myself... I just started to meet him on different planes than I had met him before. And we would hang out as these old souls holding hands looking at the sunset. Prior to this time, my father was an extremely active person. And he and I only met through doing things. And he always was very interactive. So one man who had had a difficult time with my father came to visit. And he came in and he said to my father, Hi, how are you doing? And my father just smiled at him. And this fellow walked out of the room and he said, That stinker, he still won't talk to me. Okay. Then my aunt, who loved my father deeply, came to see him. And she said, George, how are you? And my father just smiled at her. 
And she said, oh, what have they done to you? Where have you gone? And she was miserable. And it struck me as interesting that the fellow and my aunt were both miserable because my father wasn't who they thought he was. And my father and I were both in ecstasy together because we had just moved into another way of being. And what I've learned in being with other people is to not expect anybody to be anywhere other than where they want to be. That's their karma. But create an environment with one's mind so that another person can acknowledge all of their being through mirroring through your mind if they are ready and want to do so. Now, I want to just use my last few minutes in presenting the heavier part of the problem. <laughs> I was with a, an, a, 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 a ecologist, John Seed, from Australia. I was interviewing him for a television show. And John was telling me about the rate at which the rainforests were being destroyed and the immensity of the whole thing that was happening and I said to him, well, where are we in all this, John? He said, the inertia is so great now that to save us would take a miracle. You know, I'd never heard it said so baldly. We don't say this to each other. I said, that's pretty intense, John. John said, well, you know, he said, after all, we were the ones that came up out of the ocean onto land. You know, we have quite a few miracles in our history. Don't underestimate us. But what he made me realize was that all the time that I am sitting with somebody who's dying, how about acknowledging the possibility that I'm sitting at the death of my own civilization? How do I react? With denial? With depression? Is it a, a possibility that I can't let into my consciousness? Rilke says that one, that one is able to contain death. The whole of death can hold it in one's heart gentle and not refuse to go on living is inexpressible. I want us just to consider the possibility that until you and I have opened to the imminence of our own death, either personally or culturally, we are being motivated by a behavior of avoidance that is distorting the truth that we see. And that if you are going to be a true instrument of the alleviation of suffering in the world, you have to be able to look at suffering with open eyes, with all of your stuff, with your fear and all of it. It says, truth waits for eyes unclouded by longing.
If you and I are to be those people that can, in the midst of change that seems almost chaotic, have equanimity, have love, have compassion, and be impeccable in our actions because we are quiet enough to hear our unique dharmic role. If you and I are to be those people, there is nothing that we must that we can afford to avoid. We must look directly with unblinking eyes at what is. Our vulnerability will come through our distortion of perception. When you have cultivated and balanced the planes of consciousness so that that part of you that is not in time and space, that is not born, that does not die, the formless out of which the form arises, when you are resting in that equally as much as you are resting in your bodies and your personalities, then you are able to handle the changes of your body and your personality because you are also resting in that which does not change. If you are only identified with that which changes, your fear about change is too great for you to be the optimum responder to bring about healing. From the plane of souls, from the plane of awareness, you look at the dance of life and you see it as a lawful unfolding, including the suffering and the chaos and the changes, and you say, ah, so, it is what it is. Even as at the level of social personality and at the level of body, you are frightened and in pain and scared and empathetic. When I reach out to a Guatemalan or a Nepali or an Indian or an American Indian or whoever that, that is suffering, only at one plane is nice Ramdas reaching out to help helpless person. At another plane, it's no different than if this hand were in difficulty and this hand pulled it out. It is me helping myself. Whose suffering is it anyway? First, it's their suffering, and I'm helping. Then at another level, it's our suffering, because we're interconnected. And then at another level, it's my suffering, because there's only one of it. and pull back one more and there isn't suffering. There's suffering and there's no suffering. What is required to come into balance in these levels of consciousness is the ability to keep surrendering who you think you are into who you truly are. And surrender is not, seems like a big deal when you think what you're holding on to is important. Later it will seem silly. There's a story of a pig and a chicken going down the street and they are hungry and they see a restaurant that serves breakfast. And they go up to the door and on the door is a sign, ham and eggs. And the pig says, I think I won't go in there. And the chicken says, why not? And the pig says, well, for you it's easy. From you they only want a contribution. From me they want it all. You and I are being called upon to offer it all into the truth of our being.
this is the work that you and I must do. We don't even really have that much choice. Because to the extent that you would relieve suffering, you must find a way to be free of suffering in yourself, lest your suffering compound the suffering of others. You can't wait till you're free of suffering to help others so that you make the helping of others part of your practice to become free of suffering. And you work for others as a way of working on yourself. You work on yourself as a way of working on others. President Havel said, who but politicians should lead the way for this? <laughs> Except for he and the Dalai Lama, I find very few politicians I would expect to lead the way here. No, I think it is going to be the international ITA that will lead the way. But for that to happen, you can't just talk transpersonal talk. You have to become transpersonal. So I invite you to join me in the merry dance of perhaps sitting at your own death, doing it with lightness, with joy. As Brother David said this morning, the Austrians say, it's hopeless but not serious. <laughs> to look and keep death on your left shoulder, to look and see the possibility it might all end, and then from the quietness of your mind and heart to allow the compassion and appropriate action to arise out of you so that your action relieves suffering and that everybody you meet feels your passion and at the same moment your equanimity, your joy and at the same moment the way in which you bear everybody's suffering. This is what you and I are called upon to do. I can't think of a more interesting curriculum. Can I do Jubilate for two minutes? Or, okay. We're going to end with a song because David Stendelrass did one this morning, a, a chant. We're going to do a six-part round. You can learn it very quickly. It's got only three words to it. The first word is Jubilate or Jubilate, means jubilation. The second word is Deo, which means whatever you'd like it to mean. The third word is Alleluia, which means Alleluia. It's Ah, Alleluia, okay? <clears throat> and it goes like this. Jubilate Deo, Jubilate Deo, Alleluia, Alleluia. That's all there is to it. Okay, now we'll go really slow through it until you get it, because it, it's easy. Jubilate Deo, Jubilate Deo, Alleluia. Repeat. Alleluia. Okay, again with a little more firmness now. Jubilate Deo, Jubilate Deo, Alleluia, Alleluia. Now we'll just pick the beat up and the energy a little bit, all right? And it's got to be a little sharper and clearer, right? Here we go. Mm -hmm. Jubilate Deo, Jubilate Deo.
just once more crisper, then you'll really have it. Just crisp. So, mm, mm, mm. Jubilee. It. I think you've got it. Now, um, we'll divide in half and practice. We're going to do it in six parts, but we'll start with two. Jubilate Deo, Jubilate Deo, Alleluia, Alleluia. Okay, now. Jubilate Deo. Jubilate Deo, Jubilate Deo, Alleluia, Alleluia, Jubilate Deo, Alleluia. Okay, we're all set now. All right, we're going to divide across the middle of the hall here. So uh, this part here will be one, and this part in here will be two, and this part will be three, and that part back there is four, and that part back there is five, and that part over there is six. Now. A six would never be confused with a five. Everybody knows exactly who they are. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six. Now you're going to sing your own part, and I'd like to tell you that if you make a mistake, it ruins it for all of us. So while I don't want you to be nervous, we will just practice once more till we have it, just together once. Jubilate day, Jubilate day, oh, Alleluia, Alleluia. Here we go. Jubilate day, Jubilate day, Jubilate day. 